all for joining us. Thank you for the support. It's been a long week. We've done many programs this week. We really appreciate your attendance. Um, it's been a super busy week. Thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for supporting our small businesses, creating educational lifestyle, in-person, uh, virtual programs. It's been a really busy week. So we really wanna thank the Chamber and all of our community partners that have added to the content uh, for this amazing week uh, as we honor small business. Um, today, I think I said it's the last day of Small Business Week and we're all thankful. Um, and it's been an honor to work with all of our small businesses across the city. Um, we want to celebrate the diversity of small business that exists here in the city. And we want to honor the individuals that are keeping our community, our culture, our small businesses thriving. And I really want to thank our special um, guest today for making the time. I know you're super busy, but we really appreciate that you took the time to join us here. So. We know San Francisco, the nation and the world are really ready to open up and start uh, life all over again. <clears throat> and it's really important that we rediscover, discover new businesses and really um, hear the, see the faces and the stories behind these amazing small businesses that we have in San Francisco, especially. And now is the time to celebrate the organizations and the people that keep our city and our culture thriving. So we all know the city by the bay is known as a beacon of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And today we're proud to be working with DoorDash to celebrate our neighborhoods, our and um, our neighborhoods and our small businesses and our community leaders. Uh, today's program is focused on the Legacy Small Business Program, and we want to honor and feature some of the businesses that made that list. Um, I will let Michelle uh, tell us more about the program later on. So remember to stay till the end. After each um, panelist presents, we're gonna give away a gift certificate to their uh, business. So please stay and listen to all the panelists. In today's program, we'll hear a curated selection of legacy businesses who will paint a high level picture of their business, their neighborhood, and the role that businesses played in their community. So let's get started. <clears throat> My name is uh, Vaskineers. I am a small business advocate here in San Francisco. I'm actually an immigrant from Greece. I came here when I was very, very small, but uh, my father had grocery stores in the Mission and the Excelsior. And uh, basically as an immigrant, you always work in the back of your family store. We know that. Uh, my desk was actually a stack of uh, beer and a stack of Coke. So that's where I would do my homework. <laughs> and uh, since then I studied uh, design architecture and I had a design store in the Fillmore for 20 plus years. Uh, took it from a non-internet business to an internet business. So I understand the challenges of small businesses. I understand every, the everyday challenges that we all face. And um, I'm really appreciative that I have this agency now. It's called NextSF. And we create private-public partnerships to promote small business, uh, neighborhood merchant corridors, and culture in the city. So today, I'd like to welcome you to our San Francisco Legacy Business Forum, which has been sponsored by DoorDash. Thank you, DoorDash. So before we continue with our uh, program, we have a very short video from DoorDash highlighting their small business origin story as well. So uh, Dominic, please take it away. I'm an immigrant. I moved to this country from China when I was five. I worked with my mom who actually was an immigrant herself, coming here to try to be a doctor. The US didn't recognize her license at the time because she had moved here from China. We had $350 in the bank as a family. In many ways, DoorDash was founded for people like my mom, people who came here with a dream to make it on their own. They are makers, they're builders, and I think those stories are connected as part of a system that everyone gets to participate in as customers, as suppliers, as partners. One of the things I love about local businesses is that they really are human stories. They are stories of people who have many dreams. My name is Tony Shu, CEO and co-founder of DoorDash. Bravo, bravo, well said. Um, at the end of the day, we all know businesses, small businesses are more than just places of commerce. This is our, these are the outdoor living rooms that our neighborhoods have. And we gather not only to 
purchase, but also to mingle, to meet new people, see friends. Uh, so um, I'm glad that they brought up um, the value of community in that video. So by the way, we're gonna talk about legacy businesses today. And legacy businesses are longstanding. They're considered longstanding community um, serving businesses that are recognized as valuable cultural assets to San Francisco by the Office of Small Business. So preserving legacy businesses is critical to maintaining what makes San Francisco unique and a special place. So before we start our program, um, we do have a few housekeeping rules. If you miss something, if you wanna share this with friends, um, colleagues, please wait for the follow-up thank you email from us. You will receive a full video of this program plus a 10 minute highlights video too. So if you wanna share it um, on your stories, on your social media, please do so and tag some of the, uh, the businesses that are participating here today as well. So uh, you've all been on this Zoom platform for over two years now. It's really amazing. You know what to do. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section up above. Uh, after all the panelists present, we will ask the question either to a specific panelist or it could be a broad question for all the panelists that we can share. So, um, so now sit back, uh, enjoy your favorite beverage or your lunch or your late lunch, and uh, let's get started with the program. I'm proud to present uh, Michelle Lynch Reynolds. Uh, she is the Legacy Business Program Director for Marketing and Communications uh, with OEWD. So welcome to the stage, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Voss, for inviting me to today's event uh, to honor and celebrate some of San Francisco's longstanding restaurants and cafes. Uh, my, yeah, as, as Voss said, my name is Michelle Lynch Reynolds, and I work at the Office of Small Business, um, supporting the city's efforts to uplift and support businesses like these through something called the Legacy Business Program. Um, and uh, I think I'm ready for the slides, if you don't mind. Uh, and you can go ahead onto the next slide. So the Legacy Business Program is um, operated out of the Office of Small Business, which is a division in itself of the Office and Economic, of Economic and Workforce Development here at the City and County of San Francisco. So the Office of Small Business, or OSB for short, is a central point of information for small businesses. Our team provides one-on-one -on -one support for both new and existing small businesses from across the city. Our case managers are an incredible team of people um, who are working with entrepreneurs to understand the process of starting a business, registering, and navigating the city systems. We have two locations for in-person support, um, and we're open Monday through Friday at both City Hall and at the relatively newly opened uh, San Francisco Permit Center which is at 49 South Van Ness. And there we have staff specifically dedicated to helping businesses get permits that they may need for any type of business that they have. I'm ready for the next slide. Uh, this is our team. Uh, it, we are uh, 12 people strong and we have in-person translation services in um, Spanish and Chinese, uh, as well as I, believe at least 25 um, on-demand language translation services. So we help um, our many uh, immigrant founded businesses. Uh, next slide, please. So the Legacy Business Program um, acknowledges businesses that have operated in San Francisco for over 30 years, many of them much longer than that even. Uh, they contribute to the city's history and its identity, and they are also continued, committed to continue doing so. Many of our legacy businesses, including those here today, are multi-generational, um, historic, and icons. Uh, next slide, please. So the program is the first of its kind in the nation and serves as a model for other cities. It began to take shape uh, 10 years ago in 2012, when the uh, Gold Dust Lounge was being threatened with eviction. And the city, it sparked the city to try to find 
uh, new and more ways to help businesses in, uh, in similar circumstances, other businesses that may be facing um, eviction or closure. So the following year, uh, the city in support uh, in collaboration with a nonprofit called San Francisco Heritage, started something called the Registry for Bars and Restaurants. Um, and during that time, we also continued to research and advocate for a more permanent solution. And then in about March 2015, the Board of Supervisors uh, voted to establish the Legacy Business Registry. And that is when we began uh, a list of these iconic businesses of all types, so expanded beyond bars and restaurants. Uh, and then it wasn't actually until later that year that a proposition was voted in by the voters of San Francisco to designate funding uh, and real monetary resources to uh, the legacy businesses in the program. Uh, next slide. Uh, I was telling the team before the webinar started that there are 312 businesses that have been added to the registry of all types all around the city. From uh, produce wholesale to retail shops to nonprofit services, bars, corner markets, nightlife, and of course, restaurants. Uh, they are in every district of the city. Um, there are about 14% of the businesses on the Legacy Business Registry are LGBTQ plus owned, uh, and 23% and growing are immigrant owned. Uh, next slide. So joining the registry is, um, is quite a formal process, uh, and it takes several months. Uh, and my colleague, Richard Carrillo, and myself, we work side by side with applicants throughout the process. Uh, and at the end of this presentation is our contact information. If anyone watching is a prospective legacy business um, coming on your 30 year birthday and you wanna learn more about the program, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, next slide, please. So what does it mean to be a legacy business uh, officially? Um, once on the registry, legacy businesses receive several benefits most notably promotional support and business assistance and grants, uh, including a rent stabilization program. We also truly go to bat for any legacy business that finds themselves in distress. We advocate for legislation and resources uh, and ongoing support to help our legacy businesses thrive for many generations to come. And the final slide, if you don't mind. So that is uh, my presentation on legacy businesses. I'm so excited to learn and hear from the, the businesses here today. I have not gotten a chance to eat and drink at all of them. So um, I certainly will be doing that soon. I'm sure we all will all leave this quite hungry. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you so much. Michelle, bravo. That was beautiful. I, I, I actually learned a lot of stuff too. And the weekend is coming up. So these places have some great options for all of us. <laughs> and um, I just want to say uh, sincerely, thank you for all that you and your team have been doing to promote, um, you know, these businesses, because businesses are, like I said, they're more than places of commerce. It's where community comes together. And um, just a few stats from City Hall that we should share. Uh, there are actually 90,000 businesses in San Francisco, and half of them are considered uh, small business. That means they employ 10 or less employees. And these businesses alone employ almost 400,000 people here in the city. So I would say uh, small business is big business. And uh, for all of our attendees, um, it's important to remember, if, if this is amazing, if we change our buying by just 1% to local shopping, it creates $100 million back to a local economy it stays back. So um, every dollar counts. So now, uh, before we begin with our panelists, uh, my partner Dominic has created a really nice uh, video showcasing the, the businesses represented today and the owner. So take it away, Dominic. <music>
awesome. That's that should whet everyone's, you know, uh, to go and visit these businesses. So uh, first up, we've got my friend uh, Amparo Vito from uh, Puerto Alegre in the Mission District Eight. Uh, we have a really nice uh, geographic diversity here, by the way. And she is the second generation owner. She and her family own uh, Puerto Alegre. So welcome to the stage, Amparo. My name is Amparo Vigil, and I am one of many members of the Puerto Alegre family. I'm also one of five siblings who all grew up in the San Francisco Mission District. And our restaurant legacy started back in the 60s when my dad, Ileponso Vigil, and his brothers, Jose, Jesus, and Pablo Vigil, who immigrated from Mexico, a small town in the state of Jalisco called Ayucla. And they put their alcancias together and they bought their first building, which had a small restaurant in it. And off they went to work hard and make it work. But it wasn't just about working hard and making it work. It was about making it work in community. So not only did they perfect the recipes of the chile verde and chile colorado and menudo and birria and more, but because this was supposed to be a place of community, they also put in a jukebox where neighbors would come in and play music during their celebrations. And I can still hear and feel in my heart the lyrics of songs like El Libro Abierto or Androquela or El Novillo Despuntado with Las Hilerías. And of course, later we had Juan Gabriel and, and Selena partying on with us. My dad and my uncles also put in pinball machines so that our neighborhood guys had a place to come and hang out, eat, drink, drink a beer or two, and just be together after a hard day's work. I remember on Sundays after church, our neighbor families would come in with their pots for three orders of menudo or three orders of birria to go or sometimes they would stay and just eat them there with us, share them there with us. So this was my dad and his brothers, my tios and my tias, me, my siblings, and of course my cousins, and many others who, who were working hard to make it work in community together. That was our first restaurant and the beginning of our legacy. My dad always had the vision as well of expanding into his own place. So the opportunity arose and he bought the building on Valencia. And everyone told him, no, oh, don't do it. It's not going to work. It's not a good neighborhood. Back then, Valencia and 16th Street was sort of seen as a sketchy neighborhood. But my dad stuck to his vision and his belief of working hard and making it work. And together with my mom, me and my siblings by his side, off to work he went, creating Puerto Alegre. And to make it work, bringing in community, he added a pool table back then. So we learned how to play pool together with the neighborhood, with the neighbors. I remember my brothers taking on uh, the hobby of fish. And at one point we even had this huge fish tank in the restaurant. Well, years passed and we grew up watching all of this and being part of all of this. And I stayed really close to my dad. So eventually when I was ready, I took charge and brought three of my siblings with me, my sister, Patty, Lorenzo, and Willie. And as our Puerto Alegre family grew with partners and nieces and nephews and others, we added dishes, dishes from other regions of Mexico. Hence our delicious and now specialty marks, our pozole verde and mole poblano. And let's not forget that along the way, we got our hands on our liquor license and bless my brother's heart, Willie, and my siblings perfected a great margarita, which is now known and revisited from many all over the world. Working hard to make it work in community together. You ever come by, one of my siblings, Lorenzo, Willie, Patty, or I will always be there to welcome you. I like to think that we are following what my father and his siblings started. We continue the legacy of family, community, and hard work. Anyone that works in restaurants knows that the restaurant business is hard work. But many of you with siblings also know that working with your siblings is hard work too. But we have learned so much, me and my siblings, about ourselves, about each other, about our family, community, the world, and doing this together. We are blessed to be here together. We are blessed to be here past COVID, post COVID. We are blessed that we own our building. We are blessed that we each that we have each other and we have our community and we welcome everyone and we are open to everyone. We've collaborated with organizations in the, in the mission, which we consider our family and community. 
We have many a project with organizations like Poder, people organizing to demand environmental and economic rights. We have dance Zumbas and more on Sunday streets. We do art exhibits to display and promote our community artists. We celebrate Day of the Dead, Frida Kahlo's birthday. We even put up a show, Arte en Resistencia, engaging our community in the happenings of what surrounds us in the world around us. We have a women's show on right now, Esperanza, which is hanging on our walls which was curated by Alejandro, Alejandra Blum and Calixto Robles. And we're gonna be putting up a Carnaval exhibit curated, curated by Natalie Aleman. And it's to celebrate the 44th year of Carnaval. This year's theme being inclusivity, family and community. And this is to pay respects to all community forms, actions and colors of love that the heroes of our community took on to sustain us through COVID. We are community and because we are community, we're also loyal to our giants and warriors and 49ers. So we have TVs ready to root them on. Um, I'll tell you, anytime I meet someone in San Francisco and I tell them who I am, they always have a story for me about Puerto Alegre. Oh, I, my first date was there. We're married now. We have, you know, so many children or, oh, you know, I used to live in the neighborhood and I used to go there all the time or we hear from people all over the world. I can't wait to get back there. Um, and anytime someone says they don't know Puerto Alegre, I always respond to them, letting them know that you don't know San Francisco and you don't know the mission until you know Puerto Alegre. Uh, so from my siblings to you, I hope to see you soon at Puerto Alegre. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Amparo. Here. Thank you, Amparo. You know, I had a question for you. I know uh, um, in a previous uh, program we did together, Paint us a picture. What did Valencia look like back in the day when your father first came? Because now it's so vibrant. It's so diverse. It's there's so much happening. What did it look like back then? It was pretty sketchy. I'll have to say it was pretty sketchy. You know, on 16th Street, there were um, a lot of rated X theaters, just to give you an idea. You know, not to say there were lots of great things happening in that neighborhood as well. But um, but it was sort of saturated a little bit by by that. And um, other things as well. So it wasn't seen as the best place to put your money at that time. Yeah, exactly. And I asked that because I talked to some young entrepreneurs, you know, thinking about opening a business and you got to think like long term, long term, yeah. don't look at the place what it is now, because um, if we share these stories, it'll inspire other young entrepreneurs to open businesses as well. And I just want to thank you sincerely. I want to thank your family sincerely, because every time I go there, I'm always made to feel like I'm part of the family. And the way you talked about the, the restaurant in the beginning, it's still like that now. Yeah. You know, you'll yeah. sit next, you'll sit at a bar, you'll meet a stranger, you'll hit it off. And yeah. uh, the margaritas are also very good, so. Yeah, yeah. Hospitality was a big thing that they taught us and through this legacy as well. Absolutely. So, like Absolutely. our living room, and everyone is welcome, so. Absolutely, bravo. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so I want to thank you. And we do have a winner. And by the way, guys, I do not pick these winners. OK, so they're totally random. They're texted to me. But um, my friend Tim Macalino is uh, the winner for Puerto Alegre. Tim, we're going to have to have a margarita together at Puerto Alegre. So awesome. um, after the program is over, I'll do an email introduction to you and Amparo. And uh, she'll let you know how to redeem the gift certificate. Congratulations, Gra Tim. Gracias. OK. So now we are going to District 5. That's right in the middle of the city. Uh, district 5 is very, it's the most diverse district in the whole city. There's so many neighborhoods. Um, and it's a neighborhood that I know very well as well. Uh, when I had my shop there, I want to introduce uh, Nikki Cooper, a uh, longtime friend, extreme community leader. She's had her fingers everywhere, all over the city, all over the community. Um, She's the second generation owner yeah. of uh, Two Jack Nick's Place. So welcome to the stage, Nikki. Thank you, Vaz. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, as Vaz said, my name is Nikki Cooper. I'm the second generation owner of my parents' business, Two Jacks on Hate. We are in our 45th year, and I'm in my 16th year of ownership. Um, so just a little history, my parents actually owned four businesses in the city, a corner store and two jacks, 
both on Haight Street and the corner store was actually named Two Jacks as well, which is pretty funny. Um, and they had two other restaurants in Visitation Valley and Hunters Point. And each location became a cornerstone within those communities, cultivating a sense of belonging and validation to a community that sometimes and most times felt unseen and unheard. So we really became the hub um, for our communities. Um, I was actually enrolled in French American on the corner of Haight and Buchanan in the 80s. So it was a culture shock to go from French American when I was pretty much the only African American girl in my grade and in the lower school, and then to come up to um, Haight Street, which was magical. Um, I knew that my resiliency came from feeling loved when I got to Hate and Webster. When that bell rang at three o'clock, I was gonna walk three blocks from Hate and Buchanan to Hate and Webster into an entirely different world and would be fully embraced as one of its own. Um, it was a world of soul, funk, hip hop, rattling out of car stereos. It was black owned hair salons, burger stands, dry cleaners and candy houses that kept the dollars circulating in our own community. Um, this world was my grandfather's makeshift kitchen in the back of my dad's liquor store where he made his famous spaghetti and boudin sausage and would have a cast of characters from the neighborhood surrounding him waiting to get a taste of his famous Texas uh, spaghetti. Um, that neighborhood and the feeling of love came from me being able to sit on the project's steps and get my hair braided and watching kids come out of the store with fat pickles and peppermints. I mean, the community was actually love in all of its forms through music, through food, through our relationships. Um, it was a wonderful place to be. Um, and my family and my community gave me the courage to go out into the world and elevate and expand who I was and who I was becoming while being rooted in those values that I um, continue to live by today. Um, and I'll say what inspires me about the business and the community are the relationships that we've built by investing in our community for over 45 years and having a place where everyone who walks through the doors feels seen and heard. Um, so that's really our story. Um, I'm very fortunate that my parents um, were able to pass the business down to me. I'm very fortunate to still be here and all the support that we've been given. And, you know, thank you. Thank you to everyone who has supported us over the last 45 years. Amazing. What, what a beautiful picture you painted of the neighborhood and your connection to the neighborhood. So I love that. It's, it's such, I can see visually, you know, what, what it must have been like. So thank you again, uh, Nikki, for continuing the tradition. And I know you did a lot during COVID as well with, uh, with the community and feeding and all that. So uh, thank you very much for everything. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And we have a winner for uh, Two Jacks. The winner is, drumroll, Lily Zoltak. So Lily, uh, we will be introducing you to Nikki, and then she'll tell you how to redeem your gift certificate. So, um, and again, folks, if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A section, and we'll ask them of the panelists after the program is over. So thank you. And now we're going to go over to the west side, District 4, right, Krag? District 4. Um, Krag is the third generation owner of Henry's Coffee. Um, I always love going there. The aroma, the smells, the community is super unique, very special. So Craig, welcome aboard. Thanks Voss, appreciate it. Um, as Voss mentioned, I'm a third generation coffee roaster. The business was founded in 1965 by my dad's uncle. Um, his name was Antranik Devletian um, and the business was called House of Coffee. It was on Irving Street in 1972. Uh, I wish there was like a legacy business back then because the uh, the owner raised the rent and uh, kick, kind of kicked them out. So he moved to Noriega 
where we currently are. And he was so upset that the tenant didn't renew his lease that um, he wanted to buy the building. So he purchased the building and that way nobody could kick him out anymore. Um, and he ran it. Now you got to think back in the 60s and 70s, there was no Starbucks, there's no Pete's. The concept of a coffee shop didn't exist. So the business was more of a European goods store. So when you walked in, you had uh, different dried wheats, dried fruits. You had cheeses from, from Greece, Los, your peeps. We had some sausages. We had rose water. And we also had coffee, but it was freshly roasted coffee that you would take home and brew. You didn't, you didn't get served coffee to drink. Um, that didn't happen until the late 80s, early 90s. My father purchased the business in 1983. Now, my father lived in Lebanon, and when he was a boy, uh, his father had a bakery, and part of the tradition with the Lebanese culture is to have coffee with your, your sweets, and so my grandfather would serve coffee to the locals when they would come by to pick up their sweets, but in 1950s, there's no Costco, there's no Target, you can't just go buy a bag of coffee to brew it, you actually had to roast the coffee yourself, and it was roasted in like a like a wok almost in a big pan. So when my dad was 12, that was his job. So he kind of learned how to roast um, from, from my grandfather. So my, my dad moves here in the 70s. He's, he's a, um, back then they would call them like uh, system designers where there's no computers. You would design like, um, like heating systems with a pen and pencil on like those, you know, like science uh, square checkered sheets. He gets laid off. And he wants to find a business that he can do for himself. His uncle is looking to retire. My father's like, oh, yeah, I remember coffee, this concept of serving. So he purchased it from him in 1983. I still have the original seller's permit from 1965 and 1983. I have it in my wall in my office to honor both of them who started the business. So my dad runs it. I'm in kindergarten at the time. Similar to Amparo, uh, you know, that's what you did. You had free labor. So when I was 12, I didn't watch uh, Scooby-Doo or He-Man. Um, I helped my dad. Voss was, uh, when he said he was sitting on, on boxes of beer and soda, I was sitting on boxes of coffee and tea. And that's where I did my homework. Um, but it wasn't fun because it was boring. Like on Saturdays, you know, I would just fill the bags of coffee there's no music. There's nobody else. It's my dad. So I, growing up, the business wasn't very sexy to me. I didn't look forward to taking it over. Um, I graduated from UC Davis and went into corporate finance for 10 years. All the while, you know, being involved of the daily issues that would come up, you know, employees leaving, new coffee coming in, you know, toilet broke, what am I going to do, that kind of stuff. Um, my last stint, I worked um, directly with the COO, where we, my, my team was responsible for telling what was happening with the business with numbers. And it was a really situ a unique role where I had to present data to the executives, but I had to learn from the folks on the ground. So I got a good sense of what was really happening and then how to tell that story. And as I started digging into it, it always made me think during the meetings, like, oh, I wonder if my father does that. Or um, wow, that's a great idea. I wonder if my dad could implement that. And I, as I started to dig into it, I realized, geez, you know, for my dad not being uh, an educated person, he's run this business really, really well. And I saw a lot of opportunity there. So I made the switch and I, and I joined my dad in 2013 on July 1st. In fact, if you were to take a look at the back of our coffee bags, I'll see if I can grab one here later. There's a picture of me and my dad and that's actually the first day of work. My wife took a picture of it on her iPhone, and it's me and my dad, July 1st, 2015. So um, Amparo also mentioned the challenges of working with family. And, um, you know, in, in our culture, you don't tell your dad what to do, right? Um, they're the patriarch. And so it, it, it was, I'll put it lightly, it was a challenge working with my dad. And what, what, pushed us through was obviously the love that we have for each other, but it was difficult for me to want to do things my way, which I thought were going to be better for the business, but also understand how much my father had put in. And this example I give is the first four months 
I didn't do anything in the shop. And I was just observing so I could realize what should be my priorities when I want to change something. And we would occasionally run out of milk. Being a coffee shop, that's like the worst thing ever. You, you know, you're making lattes and cappuccinos. The last thing you want to do is run to Safeway to get some milk. Come to find out, you know, there was not a lot of training on how to order the milk. If somebody was calling out sick, the other person didn't know. So we'd run out of milk. So I said, aha, I got it. I'm going to create a milk order form. I'm going to tell the staff how much we need. Take a look how much we have. Subtract the two. Boom. Simple, right? So I go home. I'm sitting in the couch. My mom's on my right. My dad's on my left. And I'm explaining this concept to them. And my mom, being a traditional Armenian mom, oh, my son, you're so smart. You're a genius. I love it. And my dad's not saying anything. He's just, you know, listening there, content, quiet. So I finished my, my speech. And I'm like, Dad, you haven't said one thing. What's, the, what's up? What's going on? And he said, I feel like everything's being taken from me. And I thought, wow. For, for me to feel like such a simple concept of a milk order form, for my dad to feel like everything was being taken from him, I felt like I had to take a step back. And from that point on, um, my goal was to do everything I could to honor what my dad and what his uncle had done for the business. That didn't mean we didn't continue to fight. It didn't mean that there were challenges. But now I understood, I had some empathy on where my dad was coming from. And also my dad loved me too. And he knew yeah, as much as, you know, we do things this way, I understand what Hedog is doing. I'll let it go. You know, that's kind of the joke that he would say. Um, and we learned to, to appreciate each other. We learned our roles. You know what I mean? And we started, I started to transition the business. And one of the things we talk about here is community. Um, being of Armenian descent, I started to focus on who we are at Henry's and not as much about the coffee but about our heritage. And that led to people coming in and say, oh, I have a friend that's Armenian. Oh, your last name's an IAN. Isn't that Armenian? And we started to have conversations about, yeah, I'm Armenian. Where are you from? You know, where's your family from? And, and the community learning about, you know, they're from Laos or they're from Japan and how they drink coffee or they drink tea differently. And that's what really like helped me realize at Henry's House of Coffee, to not necessarily focus about the coffee. The coffee's great, but at Henry's it's family, right? So when you walk in, you're part of what I call the HOC family. And in San Francisco, in the Sunset District, we are fairly diverse here as well. And the great thing about online, we talked about the pandemic having a, a big impact on people. Um, it led to a lot of people purchasing coffee online because everybody was working from home. And for me, I felt like this was a great opportunity, not necessarily to sell coffee, but to tell the story of who Armenians are, what the Kalebjian family is, and what Armenian coffee means. Because we have a product, Vas, you have Greek coffee, we have Armenian coffee, Lebanese call it Lebanese coffee, Puerto Ricans have a Puerto Rican coffee. So it was fantastic when I would get an order from somebody from New Mexico and they would say, you know, I've never had Armenian coffee. I saw your story on Facebook. And I wanted to try it. And like, that's like the best gift that you could get from anybody because now the community is obviously a lot larger. And when they come to San Francisco, they're going to want to support us. They're going to want to see the space. So um, it's been fantastic. Yeah. Un unfortunately, in November, my father passed away. Um, he was in a, he was sick. It wasn't COVID. Um, but he was surrounded by his family when he did pass away. And I feel honored, you know, growing up was tough as a kid because my dad was always working. So I didn't get to see him all the time. But working here for the last eight years, it's like I had a, you know, a 2.0 relationship with him where I got to rekindle and really understand all the things that my dad really loved. And we got to bond over that. And so I feel blessed having to have had that time with him. And when he passed away, it just reemphasized like, I'm not going to change it to Harag's House of Coffee. Uh, we will continue to honor it as Henry's. And, and anything that I do, it's a, an Instagram post, a newsletter that I send out, 
a new bag of coffee. It always goes back to my dad, what he did for the community. Um, and hopefully I'll be here for another 45 years. So thanks, boss. Appreciate it. Wow, Greg, thank you so much. And this is your story, but you know, it's, it's really a universal story. It doesn't matter what immigrant yeah. group you're from. Yeah. This is, I was, you know, this was my story growing up as well. Yeah. And um, it's unbelievable. And this, this webinar was uh, inspired by, I, I go to city hall sometimes to hear these, um, you know, le legacy business applicants and they tell these stories and they short snippets and some people, you know, it brings tears to their eyes. It's really amazing. Yeah. So yeah, it's thank reality, you, man. you know, and, and everyone here from Nikki to Amparo, like, you know, yeah. we, we, we're not just a business. I mean, it's it, granted we're called Problem. a business, right? But we're yeah. like one of the one of one of the foundations of what makes San Francisco San Francisco. So it's it's an it's an honor to be on this panel and hear all these great stories. Love you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Brother. Wow. So um, we do have a winner for Henry's Coffee. Um, Martha Vahur uh, is the winner. So oh. after this, I'll I'll introduce you to Hag and. You guys can take it from there and build a long lasting relationship together. <laughs> Amen. All right. So thank you. Um, so let's see. Lastly, we're going to go to uh, District 3, right, Ida? Uh, in extremely vibrant North Beach. Uh, it's one of my favorite communities in the city. Always something happening. Uh, this is an amazing legacy business, Cafe Trieste. Um, it's, it's, it's like, a, museum that you can walk into and they have amazing coffee by the way so um let's take it over to uh ida zubi and um you're the second or third generation owner thanks awesome my name is ida zabi and i'm the third generation owner or co-owner of cafe trieste in north beach um, i am partners of my aunt adrian and the cafe opened in 1956 by my grandfather giovanni jota uh, he came from northern italy post-World War II with his daughter, Sonia, which is my mother, um, son, John Franco, and wife, Ida. They, you know, the whole story of the Ellis Island journey, they did that, so went on the boat, went to Ellis Island, and Italian Community Services, which is a local, still active here in San Francisco, North Beach, they brought them and helped get them from the East Coast over here to San Francisco. Um, shortly, my grandfather started as a window cleaner and was saving money, and he always dreamed you know, of having a business and coming to America, the whole American dream, and he opened the cafe, which was the first Italian-style espresso house in the West Coast. He opened it up at 601 Vallejo Street in the corner of Leon Grant in North Beach, and that's still our, that's our location there, and this is so many years that have gone by, you know, and it's pretty amazing. All you know, a lot of people walk in after about 20, 30 years. They haven't been there. They said it looks the same to them. It hasn't changed. Um, back then, it was the hangout for like the beat generation would come there, would come and enjoy coffee. At you know, Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, Jack Hirschman, Eartha Kitt, they'd come and hang out because everyone was accepted. And a lot of writers and artists and business people and just locals, this kind of became the living room of North Beach and to this day still is. You walk in there, you're still pe people recognize each other from 40, 50 years ago and it's you know, pretty incredible. Uh, my mother, she used to take me to work with her every Saturday. There's a lot of familiar stories here going, you know, some kids went out playing, you know, on the street. I went to my mom to the cafe and I loved it. You know, I was running around, yeah, me <laughs> too. I was running around to, you know, until about age nine, and my aunt Yolanda, you know, said, "Hey, you know, what are you doing? You know, come back here behind the counter." And oh, she started showing me how to you know, wash dishes and go clean. And so, you know, as soon as you know it, I didn't know this was the plan. So, and all of a sudden, I was working there every Saturday, and eventually learned how to make coffee, and I loved it. I really had a lot of fun. Um, there was live music every Saturday. My family would sing. My mom, my late uncle John Franco, my grandparents, they would sing and. I have one great memory I have. One Saturday, a family friend named Celeste came in and she came with her husband, Bob. He was part of this, you know, pretty famous uh, group called the Drifters. And they were there, they were, you know, the group was there. And all of a sudden they got on the stage with my uncle, John Franco and the band started playing. And 
I remember hearing these songs in my mom's car, you know, the shit the tapes, right? So I'm playing them on the way to work. And they're singing under the boardwalk, up on the roof, and everything just stopped. I mean, the whole place, everyone kind of froze and just it was amazing. They started singing along. And it just was, I was thinking about this this morning when I woke up. So I saw a picture of our friend Celeste, and I remember that day. I mean, it's just stuck in my head. I think I was maybe 10 or 11 when that happened. And, uh, just a lot of, uh, you know, you don't, it's just a place that you don't know what's going to happen. You know, you show up and special things happen, and there you are. In the early 70s, Francis Cord Coppola was working on a screenplay for The Godfather mm. at the cafe at the back table. He's bringing his little typewriter. And I think you remember Agostino from Tommaso's. He was working on my uncle John Franco in the evenings, and they were sitting down and kind of seeing what he's doing, what's going on. And here it is 50 years later, it's just, you know, huge, you know, this amazing historical movie. And it was, I think a lot of things happened in North Beach that, and at the cafe that are just, you know, part of history. So it's not, as we are saying, it's not all, a lot of it's about what brings it together is the food, the coffee, but it's the atmosphere and the people involved and the love of your business. That's why it's important, you know, to save, you know, this historical businesses, legacy businesses, and I really appreciate what San Francisco has done to really honor these businesses and make sure that they stay here because the small businesses are the backbone of the city. And um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm speechless, you know, because uh, each time I go to Cafe Trieste, I feel part of the community. I, I meet people that normally I would not meet. And what's nice about Trieste is it's a diverse range of people. <laughs> you know, you got the re longtime residents and then you have the visitors and you have longtime visitors that know the, the place as well. And, um, and the staff is awesome too. So um, it's something, yeah, I'm, I'm just, you guys are amazing. You're, you're just inspirational. Um, so thank you. Um, I just want to say that we're now going into the Q&A section. And um, I love to ask this question because you guys represent this longevity of uh, business and you've been through so many recessions and depressions and you know family strife, stuff like that. But we went through a great crisis with uh, COVID. It affected everyone personally, professionally. Um, I was asked this question, what is the, the positive takeaway? Let's talk about the positive takeaways and what did we learn from our COVID experience? Um, Amparo, you're first. <laughs> Share. Oh, I feel like I'm on the spot. But um, what did we learn? What did we learn? I, I guess the, the thing, the first thing that comes to mind is that there is no going back. There is no going back. It's only going forward from here. And, and uh, you know, who knows what's to come? We don't know what's to come from here. It feels like a whole new something and we need to think differently. We need to be different and um, both about our businesses, but also about our families and our communities, you know, about each other. And it is more about each other, you know, doing something more cohesive um, with everyone around us. Um, yeah, so there is no going back. There is no going back. Bravo. And, you know, personally, I feel inspired by this format. I know before COVID, we never wanted to see our face or hear our voice. <laughs> But uh, this is very inspiring because uh, we actually have viewers from, you know, Europe, from Asia listening to this. And it's a great way of communicating who we are as individuals and who we are as brands. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're humanizing yeah. a business because many people that uh, have no experience with small business, they see a business and they say, oh, it's a facade. It's just somebody's job. It's not somebody's job. It's someone's passion. It's someone's family history. Um, so I'm very appreciative of this way of communicating because um, it's it's a whole new way of communicating and building bridges. You know, yeah. God, God knows we need to build more bridges these days. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so um, go to Ida next. And by the way, I forgot to mention, we do have a winner for Cafe Trieste. It's uh, Christine Racher. So Christine, I'm going to send you an email afterwards. And I'm going to introduce you to Ida, and then she'll tell you how to uh, redeem your gift certificate. But Ida, tell me, what was the positive takeaway from COVID and all the stuff that we went through? The positive takeaway, I feel, especially in our, you know, majority of my clientele are regulars and they live in the neighborhood. 
I feel that COVID really brought everybody together and support each other and people kind of slowed down and started caring more. I mean, I'm not saying I didn't care before, but I think you see like the big picture, like what really matters, your connection with people, your community, with your families and just, and they're now, you know, I see when people are hanging out more, they're more relaxed and they're just taking the time to really make time for themselves and for others around them. I love it. I'm taking notes because um, that's something I think that we can all connect with what really matters um, and just taking away the negative from our everyday lives because life is so short, right? Yeah. Totally. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I go to Nikki next? And then Chago and this. Nikki, what was the positive takeaway? You know, for me, it was really personal. It was watching my parents um, really survive and um, pivot. You know, I was nervous when it happened. Um, when we were told that we needed to shut down, I was ready to do that. But my parents were like, no, we're going to switch and do takeout only. And to see that their resiliency in their 70s um, humbled me. It truly humbled me to see their strength, their resiliency, and just being invested in their business for so long to say, no, you know, we're going to stand 10 toes down and we're going to be here for our community. We're going to be here for our customers and we're going to figure out how to make it work. And to see them shine like that again in their 70s was an eye-opening experience for me because I was ready. I was panicked. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I was ready to shut down. And, but I learned from them and to be able to still learn from your parents at my age and watching them you know, be trailblazers in something that was so historic was, um, you know, it was just amazing. I love it. I love it. I'm so happy that we're recording this session, guys, because this is like retail therapy. But <laughs> what you just said is like, it's not just for business, it's for life, you know, and having that, the older generation, you know, they have this perspective that, you know, some, some people don't have. So it's yeah. kind of nice to balance that. Yeah. And not not be deterred by the every day. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Nikki. Tag. Yeah, thanks. Tell us. I, I had a very similar experience as Nikki did. I remember that day, uh, whatever it was, like I think it was like March 16th where everything shut down. And I called my dad and he said, you know, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't know, dad. We got to shut down. He said, listen, he said, when I was in Lebanon, and I was 17, there was bombs being dropped around us. Mm. He's like, if we can survive bombs, we'll be fine with the virus. I'm like, yeah, but you're 77 years old. He's like, I'll put on a mask and I'm going to work. Nothing will stop me. I'm like, you know, this guy, like, there's just like Nikki, like, this is, it's his baby. No one's taking his baby from him. Are you mm. kidding me? We'll figure it out. And just like Nikki said, we're like, all right, we're going to do takeout. Like, is anybody going to do takeout coffee? But that was the other part of it was the community, like the community was not hiding in their house. They still came to the freaking coffee shop and got a latte and got their bagel. You know, like John, who I saw every morning still came. And I'm like, man, these people, this is my family, man. You know what I mean? They're not giving up either. It was so cool to see that. And I just thought, yeah, all right. This is what we're doing. Let's go. We can keep up. We can stay open. We're okay. We'll be fine. What, amazing. Hi, lots of love. That was beautiful. It actually gave me goosebumps, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, but I want to thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, I, I kind of don't want to stop this, but we do have to stop it. <laughs> all good things have, have to come to an end. And you, you can all see, we appreciate the, uh, the, the, the history of legacy businesses because they offer a perspective that younger businesses do not have. Um, and once you see that, then it's less um, uh, jarring to, to go through what we're going through. So as you can see, uh, the Phoenix is the symbol of San Francisco and uh, the city is reopening safely and um, people are, are loving it. They're, they're discovering things that 
uh, familiar things and new things as well. And I've been all over the city and I'm inspired by the optimism and um, the newfound euphoria that exists in the city. Residents and visitors want to discover, rediscover their neighborhoods they once knew. And uh, neighborhoods, as we know, are the gems of the city. And uh, it's fun to be a, a tourist in your own city now, especially now, unfortunately, our uh, commuters are not back in town and also tourists are not back in town too. So it's really important that we all become tourists and visit places that don't, we, we don't visit. Um, and that's why we've been highlighting these uh, cultural assets, these neighborhoods, these small businesses, because they really add their beacons of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is what San Francisco is famous about. So thank you so much again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to the guests. Thank you to our panelists and have a great day.